we want to give you guys a real insight into what we see are factors that can really help you move ahead, get signed from all, all facets of an artist's point of view, labels, what they're looking for, marketing, um, and try and just help you guys get ahead because it's probably one of the hardest parts as a producer, one of the most daunting um, areas. And so on this panel, we've got some great panelists. Dee Ramirez, I'm sure you guys would agree that masterclass was fantastic just now. Graham Farmer has joined us from Data Transmission. Thank you for coming, mate. Hi. Hi. And Matt Smallwood, um, Tallroom A&R as well. Hello. So let's, let's dive straight in. Let's talk about, let's talk about at the beginning, um, artists themselves and their sound. And I think that's something that we talk about a lot at the Academy and is, is thrown around a lot, isn't it? About artists having a sound. How important is it for new artists to find a sound, to create their own identity? Do you want me to kick off? I think it's, I mean, we touched on it earlier, it's very similar from a label's point of view. You, how are you going to kind of build a tribe and a fan base and longevity if you're kind of sporadically, you know, you're putting out Deep House one week and then you're putting out a, you know, a techno record the week after. It's, I mean, there are some artists, obviously, that I won't name at the moment, but thank you very much, um, who send demos each week and you don't know week in, week out what style it's going to be. And I just, I think certainly when you're kind of learning your craft and you're trying to find your kind of position within the industry, very important to stay focused and have a target label or a set of target labels and work towards them because you kind of spread yourself too thin across too many kind of sub-genres. It's just nothing's ever going to stick. So I think that's quite an important lesson. As you say, we touch on it a lot in the Academy. When the guys are first starting out, you know, pick a lane, pick a reference track, stick to it. Um, yeah, and I, yeah, that's definitely the best way to kind of carve your, your own sound and fi find your sort of position within the industry. So, uh, Yeah, I think I, lis I listen to a lot of demos and I think are you, there's a consistency with familiarity. Like... You, when you hear someone's records, you like it, and then, the, then the, when you go to hear the next record, you're like, oh, I, I like that person, I like that, their last track, I'll listen to their next track. And when you've got no fans and no fan base, and it's about staying in your lane because you, you want those fan bases to keep coming back because they like those records. And as that fan base widens, then you can move around genres a bit, and you, you see it with the bigger eyes. They, they, yeah. They've got more space because there's more ears and more, more different tastes in that fan base. Yeah, but right at the start, it's that consistency of familiarity. Yeah, um, I think Mark's a good a good case in point of that. You know, the, the Untold Business album that he put out was technically a kind of a soulful house record, really album, and that's but that he, because he's built up you know twenty plus years worth of respect and, and trust through his fan base that it kind of earns him the right a little bit to do that. But I think if he couldn't have done that in the early days because it just would never have stuck. It's it's particularly important in your early stages of your career. And you know, when you're trying to become what is labelled a breakthrough artist, someone that's starting to make an impact on the scene, I think that is the most vital time where you really need to be sending the same message out there. And not just for your fan base, as Graham was talking about building your fans, he's totally right, but there's the second side of that as well, which is, it actually is the industry. Um, and people like, like Matt, you're trying to get your music heard by a&Rs, but also the people who I kind of call them the um, they're the gatekeepers to get to reach your fans, DJs, uh, radio promotions. Don't try and please everyone. You've got to just st stick with the sound that you're doing and stick with the people that like that. Because when you start to spread yourself too thin, you you can start putting off someone who actually was a fan of what you were doing. And when you start to change, if they're not a fan of that, they're going to switch off from you. Yeah, one thing I tell my students is, you make everything, make, make, have fun making everything, but let's, let's just remember one phrase, we don't have to release everything. Yeah. <laughs> like, Look, yeah. you can keep stuff that's just for you, and, and those great artists and great DJs in the past that have had those secret weapons, that have, they've just been those. Remember the old white labels, that were just, they were just those records that they had were theirs. So make everything. Have fun with it, because that's how you're going to find your sound. Mar yeah, you Mark's, might change sound. Mark's always had that saying, hasn't he? So a lot of the time it's about the records you don't release. You don't have to release everything. And yeah, if you get to that stage where you release a record, it could have a detrimental effect because the last record you released was great and it really worked and it connected. 
and then you rush the next one out and it doesn't quite connect to you. Oh shit, maybe I shouldn't have done that. So yeah, a lot of the times you're And what about, right. what about finding your sound from an artist's point of view, like the actual beginning part? So as a producer, I, I'm influenced by so much different music. I mean, I grew up listening to Depeche Mode, right? And I love Depeche Mode. But yeah, if I was to make Depeche Mode style music, it would probably put a lot of labels off. But I just like, I, I like all sorts of different things. So for me, it's, it's easy just to go, oh, I fancy making a melodic house record or I fancy making a techno record today, because I can, right? But that is ultimately the big mistake that a lot of new artists make because as they've just discussed, if, you don't, if, if the industry or your fans or uh, label people don't know what's gonna come, you know, be it one minute it's a techno record and then next minute it's a melodic house record, they're instantly gonna go, this guy's confused. He doesn't know what he's doing, you know what I mean? Make your mind up, mate, kind of thing. So you've got to, the importance of that for many, many reasons. And although it might be boring to actually make, continually make the same sound, that's how you're gonna build up a fan base. And it might, it might change. You don't have to panic about that. You don't have to worry that you're committing to something for the rest of your life. Your sound will develop. Yeah. And you might find through that journey that this isn't actually where I wanna be. And that's okay. You know, the, the biggest thing is not to chase the trends. It's very, very easily to get influenced by the trends that become big, because it's everywhere. It's very consuming as an artist that's gonna completely consume your creativity. You have to remember the music. What is it that you actually love? What are you inspired by as an artist? And if you're gonna actually be known for this and you want to tour, what are you gonna play? Because everywhere you go, you're expected to play the music you've released. And it, it sounds really obvious, but a lot of artists we talk to, a lot of students in the academy don't actually really think about this at the start. And I know as producers, there's fear. I know, well, I know I do, and I know a lot of people we speak to, when it comes to playing your own music out, it's quite a weird thing. It's a 100%. weird experience because it's not music that you love in that same way of, of music you've discovered. But that's where you have to start. You've got to really think about what is it I actually love? What do I want to be known for? And I've got to be happy playing that. Yeah, I've, in, I've interviewed people where, they've, where they're a year and a half into it after they've made a banger and, it, and it's gone blown up and it's been massive. But they're, they're like, I hate it. I hate, I hate the track. I hate the record. I hate the sound. I'll probably do it for another year and a half and then I'll have a break and then I'll come back with the actual sound that I want to do. But right now, they're, they're, not, they're not happy. They're not... They're not you know, they're just in this place where they have to keep, they're getting booked and they're getting booked and it's great because it's paying the bills and their, their responsibilities to whatever they've signed up to. Mm. But they're basically stuck in this space and it's like... Dawley was a good example of that. Yeah. When Dawley blew up, actually, was it dubstep? Yeah, he played dubstep and then he was really stuck in it. and He was, he was just, touring, doing it and it wasn't the music he actually loved. Yeah. And then, and then had a break and then he's now in a space where he's happy again and... And you, a lot of people spoke about mental health and you don't want to be in that space where you're just really unhappy playing music you really hate because you made one bang out because you haven't took a little bit more time and a bit of patience. Yeah, think about it. And from a, from a label's point of view, I, I say this because we see this in the academy a lot. You know, we're teaching to really look at what's going on in the scene, where you want to be. And as Dean spoke about, you know, we use reference tracks. We really recommend using reference tracks. There's such a fine line with that. Because one thing I think that Matt will emphasize is labels are not looking for copycat artists. And that comes from the creativity when you're producing. We see so many producers get obsessed, like there's this one sound right before the drop, and they did this trick, how do they do that? How do they do that? It's like, don't worry about that. What are you gonna have fun? What are you gonna create? But cause you're not looking for a copycat of someone you've already signed. Not at all. I mean, if that space is already filled, it doesn't make sense to then try and refill it with something else. So I think originality is key. It obviously needs to fit within the parameters of the label. Otherwise, it, I mean, you'd be surprised how many kind of like drum and bass demos we get sent through and all sorts of, uh, all sorts of crazy, crazy stuff coming through to the inbox. But, um, but yeah. even when you, when you dial it down to house and tech house, yeah. I think it's what we spoke about earlier. There's a difference. Yeah. Yeah, you just don't, you don't want to kind of, yeah, you don't want to repeat artists that are already there and are filling the space and kind of ticking a, filling a certain void. I get a lot of records that are 
kind of akin to that kind of new frame of in sound, that old school kind of Dutch. And we're kind of already doing that. And again, a lot of new artists are coming through and obviously using it as a ref, as ref tracks, which is fine, which we encourage doing in the academy. But in terms of, you know, you need to be able to push that on and put your own kind of stamp and create your own sound. We use, use it as, as inspiration, if you like, for want of a better word. But you need to be able to push it on personally as, a, as, a, as your own producer in your own space, you know? Yeah. There's a lot of space in house music and tech house. And there's a lot kind of, as you spoke about earlier, there's loads of subgenres. Yeah. Do you, as you see a subgenre emerging, do you think I'd like an artist in that space? Because I've got all these other, I've got some of these other ones that feel for Tour Room and I, they, they're doing great. But do you think, do you ever look and go, that's a quite cool little scene that's popping. Do you think I need, it'd be nice to have someone in that space? Or does Depends it Depends what it is, really. I mean, the whole, you know, the minimal tech thing is kicking off, but that would never work on Tour Room. And that's the, another conversation, you know, there's records that I've sort of turned down over the years that people have come up to me and say, oh, you know that record you turned down? I put it out on stereo, it went top 10 on Beatport. And it's like, well, that's great, but it wouldn't have done that on Tour Room because it's not you're not talking to our fan base, you know? So I think you need to, you need to be able to preach to your, fa if there's a, a, a new faddy kind of sound that comes up, I'm not necessarily like chasing that, thinking, oh God, we've got to be in that. So like I said earlier, when we did our first chat, that pendulum swings all the time. So I think you stick, stick true to yourself, stay in your lane, and you, you'll, you'll, get the, you'll get the respect for, for doing the right thing and sticking to your kind of ethos as a label. But always, obviously, open for hearing new, new sub-genres and new sounds and stuff, of course, because that's how you develop the brand and you develop, develop your sound and push forward as, as a business. So always welcome you know, new styles and new sounds, but I never go, never go chasing it, actively chasing it, no. Okay. Let's, let's talk about demos as well, then. So at the actual, you know, we'll get to sort of demo submission etiquette and stuff. <laughs> but I think for you, at a label, what's, what's, really, what's a common thing that you see with demos, where they're falling short, where they're not quite getting there? I think, I think the biggest thing, the biggest thing is that little adrenaline rush when you finish a track and you're like, wow, this is, this is my best thing I've ever done, this is brilliant. And I used to do it to you, I don't know, because you're grinning, because you, know, you know what I'm going to say. So before I started working at Torum, I would always send Pete demos before I worked there. I've been at the label for 12 years, but been producing for a long time before that and I used to do exactly the same thing so I know it's a thing because I did it and if I'm honest probably still do it myself but you know it's like you get that rush of blood you're in the studio you know you hit bounce you play it off play it in your headphones you're like, oh my god this is brilliant love it this is the best thing I've ever done and before you've lived with it and you've played it in the car or you've listened to it walking around doing your weekly shop or in the gym or whatever or listen to it on your laptop or your airpods or that's it bang you hit hi, hi Pete yeah I think I've got I think I've got it I think I've got it this is the one and then he comes back, yeah, it's not quite right, you know, but and you're like, oh, geez, okay, right, great. But then you listen back to it and you're like, I've had a bit of a rest from this. And I don't, oh, I don't think that vocal's not quite right or that piano's not quite right. I don't like that chord sequence. And we're all guilty of like rushing music out. And once we've finished it, we have this crazy rush of blood to the head. We're like, oh my God, it's got, we've got to sign it. The one, one bit of advice I would say is that no one's got a gun to your head saying you have to send that now. Just step away from it, even for like a few days, a week, Go back to it, because you know it's like through the academy, when you listen to something with fresh ears, if you've had a two or three day break from a track and you go back and listen to it, if there's anything that needs changing, it's so obvious. But you, you, know, you kind of come, we call it tech house blind, where you're looking at everything on, on an Ableton project. Um, and you just don't hear the obvious things that need changing. I think we're all guilty of that. Mm. So the, the recommendation would be step away from it, work on something else, give your ears a rest. Go back to it. Don't watch it as a project as well. That's, I remember reading um, mm. an interview with James Abelia and he said that he used to get a tea towel and put it over his monitor so he couldn't see the track progress. He said, because I'd look at it and I'll, I'll just tweak that. He said, I'll never listen to it from left to right. I'd always be tweaking. He said, whereas if I, if I cover yeah. it up and just walk around my studio, I hear it as a piece of music rather than a project. Yeah. And that's when stuff becomes really obvious and you're like, oh God, that's too loud. That's too quiet. Breakdown happens too quickly. The arrangement isn't right. Because uh, I think as well... For, for me, I, I, it's even longer than that. I've, I've walked away from projects for months and then come back to them with fresh ears and been totally reinvigorated and excited yeah. by it and realised that there's another 20% I can get out of that. So it's different for everyone, but that record's not going to age, is what I'm going to say. In your mind, you're thinking it is. So no one else has heard that. The scene hasn't moved on that much, much yeah. in two months. And the thing okay. is, as well, certainly if you're kind of in the early stages of your career, it's kind of the same as me sending promos to artists that aren't going to support them. It'll only take an A&R, sort of three or four of those, where you're like, 
yeah, he's just, they're, just, they're just not quite ready, they're not quite there. So next time it comes in, you've already got a preconception, or is this going to be the one, or are they still... And you don't want, you don't want to turn A&Rs off, so you want to make so, sure it is your best work. See, so that's what I was going to say, like, how do you know, or what is the thing with it making sure it's your best work? The other thing I, I've, we've got to say to people is DJ with it. Play, play it at home and see if it stands up against your favourite tracks. And if you... If, you, if, you, if it doesn't, then you can hear it. You'll hear it in between, if you mix it between two, of the, two great tracks yeah. that you know are great tracks, um, if it, you'll hear the difference. And if it, you can then hear from, a, from that point of view. What it needs doing, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, um, when I did a record a few, no, 10 years ago or something, it turned out to be quite a big record. That's exactly what I did. I was taking it home, I put it on CD, it was CDs at the time, and playing it in a set. <laughs> And it was just like, oh, you can really hear what needs doing to it. It's really it, obvious. At the same time, it can be quite debilitating as an artist, <laughs> can't it, though? <laughs> Putting it in a set against loads of top ten artists, oh, and then God. there's your track not mastered. But I've got work to do. <laughs> <laughs> I think the thing is, though, what everyone's saying here is, it, and it is hard, there isn't a magic answer to this, like, when do you know? But deep down, I think most of us have a gut feeling when we take time away, when we listen to something, is that actually our best work? Can we actually do something better with that? The sounds that we're using, the vocal or the stab, is that killer or have I just been a bit lazy with that sound choice and gone, yeah, that'll do. That lifts the record. How good is that sound? Yeah, we, uh, we, we listen to demos every Monday. I have a Twitch stream and uh, every Monday afternoon we listen to demos and it's really great because over the last two years of doing it, we'll see people that have come through that have gone, that was, the ideas, are the, they'll drop the same idea in every couple of month, every couple of weeks, and it's they can do that because we'll just go, yeah, this is getting better. We, you, you've changed that, or you, we can hear you've changed the thing, and that's that. Watching that process and um, of it just evolving a track is so lovely. Um, the other thing we we we'll, people will, in the audience will go, I can add something to that, and they'll then jump on and collab with it because then it, they can add that ten percent, or they can they've got another idea they can make it better, which then takes that project in a whole different way. It's, it's nice. See, that's a huge thing, right? And obviously, what we do within the academy, that, that's a, it's a different thing. It works, you know, people sign up for production courses. They get feedback along the way. But that's definitely a huge piece of advice, we would say, when you're actually working. Because producing can be quite a lonely thing, right? We spend a lot of time in front of our computer on our own. And that's when the self-doubt starts to creep in. Having people that you can play music to that isn't your mum, or your best mate that just tell you everything sounds amazing. It's really important, really important to get that sort of assistance. I mean, what's interesting is Matt, the way Matt will work with a lot of successful artists is those big successful artists actually have the luxury of being able to send music to Matt that might not even be in, in, a, in a finished state, sometimes just a 16 bar idea, right? But yeah. there's a really interesting concept there between how good the idea is against sometimes the finished track. Yeah, and I think that comes at a different point in your career. So a good example would have been the, uh, the Left Wing Cody record, I Feel It, because John from Left Wing Cody was actually renting the, the tour room studio. He moved to Maidstone, long story, uh, and he was renting the studio, and he came in one Monday morning, and he was like, oh, I'm just about to walk through and get started for the day, and he's like, oh, Matt, I think I've got something to play you, actually. And I was like, okay, cool, so come and find me at lunch. So I came and sat at my, at my desk at lunchtime, and I just, you know, plugged in and whatever. So it's, it's just a vocal on a piano, but I think there might be something in it. And it was I Feel It, which obviously went on to be a huge record, and we did a JV with Columbia on it and stuff. And that was literally like a 12-second piano vocal, no drums, no nothing. But that idea was like instantly the goosebumps on my arm told me that it was, it was a big record. You, you know, your, your gut feeling doesn't lie. Do you know I mean, I'm, not, I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm not telling everyone to send Matt just eight bar ideas. <laughs> yeah. Some like, drums would be nice. Like it really, but there is, there's a thing in this though of just how important the actual idea is against all, the finished track. Yeah, I've always said that I would rather pick up or at least work on a really solid idea, a really solid hook, something that excites me, that moves me, that engages me, other than a really polished, you know, six minute with a bow around it, mastered, sounds great, but I'll forget it two minutes later. It's all in that backbone and the spine of the record. If something gives me goosebumps or makes my heart beat a little bit faster than it was beating before I hit play, then I want to I hear more of it and I want to develop it and work on it. Rather than listening to something that sonically sounds oh, great, lights up the room, sounds fantastic. But I've played something else after it and I've now forgotten what that sounded like. It's so all from, about that core idea. From an artist's point of view, have you worked like that where you've worked on 
lots of ideas, but I realise one has got the magic, that's the one you're going to then put the time to? Or are you just producing and finishing all of them? So uh, I, I've sort of been a bit disillusioned at times when I've thought, I've got this great idea, I'm going to send it to the A&R man in its idea stage, thinking that you're going to get some feedback and then you can finish it off. But it doesn't work like that. It never works like that. In an ideal scenario, you could send it to Matt and Matt goes, oh, I like it. It's a great idea. Carry on. Do this, do this, do this, and do this. But A&R men, um, and especially if you don't have a relationship with them, they just will not give you that feedback. So it, it was a real balance of getting the finished record to a really good point, but it having a really amazing idea. So, you know, so it's no good, like thinking, oh, this is okay, but maybe if I mix it a little better or I master it better, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to like, prick up the ears. No, you've got to be really honest with yourself and go, right, has it got the full package? Is it, is it ready to go, you know? I think that's the key, being honest with yourself, whether you really believe in this work, that it has, has got something to it. And that's interesting what you were saying about, you know, not having that ability with A&Rs. I think that's a good point to move on to. Mm -hmm. What is the overall power of networking when it comes to sort of demo submission and how do you how do you start with that as someone who's sitting in their bedroom producing on a laptop and doesn't have connections not even just in the industry within the producer community where where do you start yeah i start i, I mean when i started data transmission i wanted to meet a lot of people because it was well, i need to get a brand out there i need to i want to i want to do interviews with people so i definitely would go to parties i definitely would do the guerrilla kind of tactic at parties i would if i couldn't speak to one artist, I'd find out their management, and then I'd, I'd go to a party with one of their other artists on, which maybe was a bit smaller because it was a smaller artist, but I knew their management might be there, and then I'd meet the managers that way. Uh, same with labels, like if I, I you, you can see the route to toilet sometimes, if, it's, if there's a green room and there's a backstage, but the, there's never a toilet in there, and, I, and you can see, if you watch it long enough, you can see the route to toilet, and you're just like, okay, well, I'll just stand in that route. And they've got to come past me at some point. I'll just dance I've, in that route. I've experienced that firsthand in London at 338. Was and it I, me? <laughs> I was going to say, Excuse it was Graham. <laughs> Strangely, we was, we was all in the DJ booth drinking Mark Knight's Rider, as we normally do. But I spotted someone at the back of the club. I felt a bit uneasy. Someone felt like they were just watching me <laughs> for ages. And it was a bit like, okay. And it wasn't until I left and I had to walk right across the entire club to use the loo at the back and they just sort of went dunk in front of me. And I was like, oh my God, it's that person that's been watching me. But they were really nice. But they were really nervous. They were like, look, I've just been waiting to choose my moment. And can I just buy you a beer? And I just want to just grab you for five minutes. And I was like, yeah. And they handed me a USB. And it made such a difference and impact that, look, we listened to the music. It wasn't right. We didn't sign it. But then the next time, another event or something, he came over and just went, do you remember I was that guy? And that was it. We, we actually started a, a bit of a friendship. He, he took a took a risk, took mate, took yeah. an opportunity. Yeah, I think there's always there's always the people that hang around the door, and they're always like, "You want to go to the loo?" So it's like you're just going to kind of go quick, high, high, quickly past them. But then on the way back, then you've got they're they're, they're cool now. They're they're in their stride, and you can get them then. It's like they shake it your hand so, with a wet hand. As long as they wash their hands. hands. The other one is the other one is also like foreign festivals uh, for us, like Croatian festivals, for instance. The, the barriers around creation festivals are, are not as big as some other festivals. Uh, so the, 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 you can speak to DJs because they're literally across a, 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 a guarded fence, like a, not a guarded fence. So it's like, you just, hi, how are you? I'm Graham and, you know, can I talk to you about my demo or can I talk to you about your label? Um, so there's a lot in face-to-face -face here is what we're talking about. And a, and a lot about just kind of, just remember they're people at the end of the day, first and foremost, and it's just, hi, how are you? And just, just, I always think, go and say, you know, hello, I'm Graham, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm DJ, I'm a producer, can I talk to you about something? Or can I ask you a question? Or, you know, don't be, don't be sh shy, just yeah. kind of get in there. Don't be daunted by who they are, they're just normal, everyone's Yeah, normal there's a great book by Mel Robbins, which is called The Five Second Rule, and it, basically you have to count down five, four, three, two, one, and then do it. Um, and I use it for a lot of things, especially with, like in the morning when you, wanna, when you know you want to go for a run, or you know you want to go to work out, right, five, four, three, two, one, I've got to put my trainers on, and I'm out the door. But like same with like what going to talk to anybody in the industry, like five four, I'm gonna just go and talk to them. Was, was you nervous? Did you was you are you someone that's like really oh. confident or was you very nervous when you first started data transmission? I'm still nervous thing? now. I'm i I'll still I I am six foot six and I'm still flipping nervous all the time. Like 
I'm on camera all day. I'm sh I'm shy as fuck. And and oh sorry. Um, and 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 um. I'm terrible. Like I literally have to force myself into everything. I have to force myself into speaking on camera and speaking so speaking to anybody. So the key is to find things that can help you with that. I definitely found once you become a, a I become a parent, it was a bit easier. And you know that other there are other parents because you're like, oh, how's your kids? As and that end. and that kind of it's a it's a little bit easier. Or if you know someone's like Mark, for instance, plays football and he, he's all yeah. about football. I definitely would talk to him about football if I didn't have anything else to talk about, you know? That's, yeah, that's one thing I was going to say. And they get caught out when he starts giving you questions back like, and you know yeah, nothing yeah, about it. Yeah, I love it. the offside rule. Love it, yeah. Um, that, that's, that was one point I was going to make, find a common ground with people. It's the same with me with football. Like Lewis John, for example, is a guy who came through the academy. We got chatting at 338 and he's a diehard Cardiff fan. I'm diehard West Ham for my sins. And uh, so we had, a, we had a, a bit of a shared interest and that, that was his kind of in. We used to like chat on Instagram about the football and stuff and yeah built up a relationship so when he kind of sends me demos and stuff I'm like, oh, it's from Lewis you, you know you make a bit more time because you've got that personal that personal touch I think certainly in a digital era for want of a better phrase is really important as you say because we're all people and we're all in it for the same reasons we've all got the same love and passion for for music so yeah that personal personal contact and, I always um, think when you give someone a USB as well make sure you've got your photo of your face on the USB because when you get because when that when they stick it in that when they stick it in their drive the next week They'll go, oh, oh yeah, I remember, I remember that guy. I remember that guy, that girl. I spoke to him in a club. And that because they see your face, again, then they're more likely to listen to music. It sounds mad, but the people going above and beyond to like be recognised, we have had some quite crazy ones like that at all. Yeah. Um, from the early days of a USB sellotape to a bottle of bud in the post. Sign, <laughs> sign that one. <laughs> <laughs> FYI. <laughs> but actually, we had, we had a USB in the post, and they had had a Torum logo printed on it, and it was set in this little Perspex box. And Still got that. And it, there was like a little arrow on a post bit note saying, press this, and we pressed it, and all these lights lit up the, the Torum logo on the USB. But the thing is, what happened there, what I'm trying to say is, that wasn't just the A&R looking at that. They then walked around the office going, look at this, look at this, look at this. Suddenly, there's 10 people looking over this demo. How else do you get 10 people's attention well, no, at a record label? One, one, another really good example of that, I was at, last year we was at ADE and there's a, a, a Brazilian guy come up to me after we'd done like an A&R panel, a bit similar to this, and his artist name was B-Lion, and he just come up to me and he pulled something out of his bag, he was like, I've got a demo for you, and I was like, okay, great. And he pulled out a Brazilian football shirt, and I was like, oh, he obviously knows I like football, and he was like, yeah, he said, if you scan the QR code on the arm, it takes you to my, to like a, a SoundCloud demo page, and I was like, no way. So I scanned it on my phone, bang, three demos come off on SoundCloud. And I, I mean, elaborate. I'm not saying that's what you need to do, but I mean, fantastic. Got, again, I, I did like a social media post about it and tagged him in it, and he got more followers. And again, now every time he sends me something, I'm like, oh, that's, you know, b line from Brazil. And you've got that, and you've broken down that initial barrier of contact. And so, yeah. That's, the, that's what I'm taking from this conversation is that the cold demo drop to info at whatever label, insert label here. It no longer really works, and I think you've got to think outside the box. Yeah. yeah. It does work, but what we're trying to say is, for networking as well, push yourself outside of that. Yeah, exactly. So when you do get a demo, and you go, oh, it's that guy. I've met him outside the toilet that time, Graham. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The so, like, follow me to the toilet. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna be watching off. <laughs> so, what about like more grassroots stuff as well? Because, other than you know, what you guys are doing right here, going to conferences is, is an amazing step, talking to people. How, how else can people, you know, go further in building a creative network as artists? Well, I mean, let's start with the, the Tool Room alumni group, for instance. You know, if for students of, of Tool Room, there's something called the alumni group. If you've finished a course or if you've been through a course, then you are automatically enrolled into the alumni group, which is um, uh, it, it's a Facebook. You know a little bit more about it than, than I do. But yeah, it's, it's a group where, you know, they're in their hundreds now of students can meet and chat and collaborate. And I think even outside of the academy, though, what, we, what you can take from that is, try, is trying to create these groups yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some, like we've got our Discord and that's all producers and DJs. And, and they're, again, they're working with each other. They're making tracks together. We actually have a, a section on Discord, finish my track, and people will just drop their, I can't, I've stuck. And other people will jump onto it. Or like I said, we listen to demos live from Discord. Um, there are some other great Discord communities which are popping at the moment. There's one called Kick and Bass, which is West End's thing. Um, and again, that's again that's full of producers that are 
work with each other. They do, they do production stuff in there, which is really cool. Um, yeah, the, the, the Discord is growing mental at the moment for groups. So the big thing here, what we're saying is push outside of your comfort zone, maybe, but just reach out. Don't be alone in doing this because opportunity will come from that, from come from collaborations and meeting people. Yeah, also, but also, like you're saying, conferences. Conferences are great, and not just come and meet you or, or Matt or like everybody in here could be could be a label owner in five years' time, could be a somebody in ten years' time, and I literally, if I would shake everybody's hand in here, I'd literally try and meet everybody everybody in here because that that network you start here I might in ten years' time go. Oh, I'm going to sign your record, and you go. Oh, I met him in Berlin at the conference ten years ago. We've definitely had that. Like, yeah, yeah. There's a lot for that. So, let's go into the nitty gritty of demo submission as well. Like, what's what's some of the the the, the most obvious do's and don'ts? I know a lot of people talk about this, but I think sometimes it's undervalued because I think you still receive demos that are dear de dear defected. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well done. Fall at the first hurdle. Just, yeah, just, just for a start, just do, do your basic things right, you know. Um, a nice introduction email, it doesn't need to be war and peace, but a bit of an introduction, how long have you pr been producing for, any other labels you've released on. Um, that's always just a nice little, little nugget-sized bit of information about you as an artist, just to give me a bit of an idea of where you are, where you are in your career and how long you've been producing and stuff for. Um, the number of demos to send at one time as well. I mean, if you're sending a a SoundCloud link with 15 demos on, I'll be honest, you get to four or five and you're, the needle drop becomes longer and longer and it's like, or again, like we, we touched on earlier, put your best foot forward. Don't, don't start sending 10, 12, 15 tracks to a, an A&R because it's, it's, a, it's a busy role. I mean, we get thousands of demos a week that we all have to kind of divvy up and, and sift through be between everyone in the office. So that would be another, another big thing. It's, you know, two, three max if, if, you know, max out of three. Don't any more than that and you're just... You're just watering everything down. You've got to think it's from the same producer on the same period of their of their their path, if you like. So they're all going to have a bit of a familiar sound. So by the time you get, go, I always go back and I say, send me your best two, because then they can go through and right. This is my best one. This is, and yeah. But, but I guess if they like all, th you like all three, you can also ask and go, have you got more? Oh yeah, I mean yeah, I mean if you're going to send me three and I want to hear more, then that's great. But rather than do it the other way round and send yeah, of me course. fifteen and say I need to hear less, it's, it's your brain always does a weird thing when you see fifteen tracks and it from demos. It, goes, oh, you, you just, it, it just goes. <laughs> it's just it's just over, oh. yeah, it's just overwhelming. How'd you go? Ah. <laughs> it's just just overwhelming, isn't it? It's just yeah, it's just yeah. Just put again, put your best foot forward. Two, three, two or three of your of your best tracks. And Something as simple as the sort of the, the metadata side of organising stuff. I'm still amazed at students that study with us and it gets to the end of the course and they send me their final track and it's like something final bounce in capitals, then, then underscore V3.1. Final, and final, the, final, final. And then their nickname <laughs> and I'm like, who is that? I don't actually know what student that is. Yeah. I know it sounds obvious and it it's sometimes can be advice that's like how to suck eggs, but honestly... Even your email address in the track title. Yeah, exactly. So I was chatting to Wes about it yesterday from Defected. He did a really good talk yesterday. He said exactly the same thing. He said the amount of times I'll be sat on a plane and I'll be skimming through demos. He said and it's just like demo V1. He said, oh, this is really good. Who's done that? And it's just like demo V1. It's like, oh, great. Because you're, you're never going to be able to track that down through the thousands of demos that you get. So it sounds, again, it sounds really simple, but name, email address in the, in the actual track title. Make them downloadable as well. And that's the one thing. Whenever I send demos to Mark, he's like... I need it downloadable because I'll download it and I'll, if, if I like it on the plane, I'll play it at the weekend. You've got to remember a lot of these A&Rs and a lot of the guys that you're sending these demos to, they want to play these records out in a set. If they play it in a set and it's going off, they're going to be they're going more likely to sign it because they're like, wow, I played that track from Joe Bloggs on Saturday, it went off, we need to sign that. One thing that a lot of people always ask is, what happens when you get no reply? How long do you wait before do you chase it up or do you send it to someone else? I think there's a there's a... a a respectful level of chasing up time, for <laughs> a better phrase. What's the average? Don't, what don't would sort you of chase say? after two hours and be like, so, do you want to sign it or One not? One week? You know? Two weeks? A, the... a week, I think, is an acceptable time to go back and say, just a little bit of a nudge, I know you're busy, just putting this at the top of your inbox, give me a shout if you're feeling it, whatever. Yeah, I, th I go for a normally a, a two nudge after a week and then after two weeks and then I'm... And then, then you fall onto the toilet. And then, and then I'm on the next, and then I'm onto the next label. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a fair shout. That's a really good shout. I don't you, you do have to remember that I, I'm not just making excuses for myself, but the actual role of being an A&R is 
the inbox is just insane a lot of the time. And it is almost impossible to get back to every single person. But, um, but yeah, a little nudge. I also think with the demo submission, the, you, the subject of the email is, is, uh, is a hook and a potential hook. And I think if you've, you've had a release with somebody else, use that as a leverage in, a, in, that, in, that, in that subject. So if you see a demo email and it says so-and-so's demo and it says... Cold cock support or something. Cold like, cock oh, support, yeah. Or yeah. had it saved or, you know, or someone that you normally think is a, you know, in your kind of radar of labels that you might sign other music from. That's, that's a leverage and that's a hook and it should be, you should use that hook. So obviously, you know, as, as times move forward now as well, we use Label Radar as a demo submission site where we can go and they're, they're organised for us, which is fantastic. In your honest, you know, total honest view, would you, if you're utilising Label's online demo submissions, would you also follow up and do a separate like, email submission as well? If you as the artist... If I was, if I was using... Like, like Label Radar or Track Stack, because Track Stack's pretty banging now for certain labels. Um, if I knew that a and I would email them. I was going to say, personally. it would depend, depend on the relationship, I think, wouldn't it? Yeah. If I didn't, then I would just use the system. Um, if I'd had a previous release, I'd, I'd, I'd go back by email. Um, again, yeah, it depends on the network, depends on your relationship. But if you didn't have any relationship, you know, what we're saying is push forward and reach out. Would you, would you do both? I'd, I'd, I'd try and search an a and on LinkedIn for sure. Uh, I find LinkedIn's great for, for, for label owners because essentially it's a business platform. You s search Tour Room and all of you come up, which is lovely. Um, so you can find out who's, who the actual A&R is. It's quite easy to guess email addresses, by the way, as well. When you go on yeah. LinkedIn and just see that, it's generally first name at thelabel.com. So or, if you're just or, trying blindly, give it a go. Or first name, la or, f or first letter, last name as well. That works sometimes. Yeah. There's a lot of like going above and beyond and a bit of research and a little bit of detective work but it pays off it pays off that's, yeah. fight, fight. that's laughing because he's just well, thinking yeah, cheers Pete everyone's going <laughs> everyone's going to email Matt, you a massive inbox everyone can back. now guess Matt <laughs> dot smallwood it's actually not <laughs> so like let's let's talk about let's talk about resilience that we've got up here on the screen so imagine if you imagine if you've been making music for a few years two three years and you feel that your music is at a level you feel that I've got tracks that are amazing and you're constantly sending out, you've got a label in mind and you're, you're hitting those labels and you're getting rejected, you're getting a lot of no's or no replies. That is quite, it's quite dehabilitating. You know, we talk about mindset a lot in the academy and how much that can affect you and affect your creativity, your will to keep going. What, what's your advice to artists to, to, to push through that? It happens a lot and it's one of the big problems well, for, for an artist is the having to face the rejection of the no's, you know, because personally for me, it's like I can pour my heart and soul into a track and make it the best thing I ever, I've ever made. And then if somebody says no to me, it's like, it's like the worst thing that could ever happen. It's like being stabbed in the heart. I'm like, oh, you know, I'll go to bed and never and not get back out kind of thing. It's horrible. Um, so therefore, I have to put things into place to make sure that I'm strong, mentally strong, so I can cope with this. And it's, you know, it's resilience. And it's things like, um, you know, taking care of my mental health, making sure I get a good night's sleep, exercising. I know it sounds cliched, but these things make me mentally stronger so I can, I can cope with this, this no thing. Because it happens a lot. Even big artists, you know, even like I, I've had, a, had to deal with a lot of no's. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I've set up my own labels over the years is because I got so sick of the no's that I was like, I'm just going to put it out anyway, you know, I'll do it myself. So it's having the sort of mindset to understand that it's not going to be easy when you go, you know, go into it with that mindset, but try and be strong mentally. So then when you do get the no, you can then think, OK, what is wrong with the music I'm making? I need to adjust it. Clearly, it's not working. Clearly, the label isn't picking up on this. Let me reevaluate, step back and go, what can I do to change this to get their attention? And sometimes it's not just you as well. If you really believe in your music, it, sometimes it's just that label's not right. And we see this a lot where artists can get utterly obsessed with wanting to release on Tool Room. And it's like, take a step away from that and actually try and listen to your music and look at it. It might actually be better off in a different place. Also, also it's not no forever. Like, remember, like for a label, you're a, you're a business and 
your, it, for you, it has to be a business decision as, as part of it, as well as the creative decision. So it's not a no forever. Your, your DJ business, your producer business, doesn't align with their business right now. There'll be other businesses that will do, and there, there are other labels that do. And like for me, if, if I was going searching for labels, I think that would be the most fun thing ever to do. Like I literally go and sit and listen to tons of music and tons of labels and, and go down little rabbit holes of artists that make similar music and see what labels they release on and, and just build a massive list of labels that are other potentials. It, once you do get the no, you get the no, right, okay, take a day, take a few minutes, let's go, let's go again and again and again and let's get the music signed and start building up your release schedule, your releases and, and then your business will then maybe essentially align with your business because other things stack up apart from the creative. Yeah, I think that's a, good, that's a valid point you made about having target labels. It's something we talk about in the academy quite a lot when we sit down with the, the students at the very start of their journey. We're like, right, handpick five labels that you'd like to release on and have a target list of labels, you know? And if after two, three years they're all saying no, are you writing the right music for that label? Like you say, oh, is, it, is it right for those labels or not? You know, you need to take a step back and make sure that fundamentally the music you're writing is actually going to sit on those labels in and, the first And place. it doesn't come straight away, does it? You know, you've got to admit to yourself that it's going to take, that journey's going to take a while. And the, it's an old cliche, but the, the saying goes, uh, you, you can climb the ladder, but you have to take it one step at a time. Don't expect to be able to get to the top in one go. You know, work your way up. And like you said, have the target, aim for it, but you know, maybe start smaller. But it's, it's funny enough, because we actually call that concept ladder labels. That's something we often talk about and say, have the label that you really want to get to. That's fine to say, I want to get signed to Torum, Defected, Solid Grooves. What might be the route there? What's actually, what might be the route to get there rather than getting obsessed and then a year of no's and getting really down? That's where you can do what Graham was touching on and do research and look at the labels that artists often release on, on their way. Because a lot of those artists that are releasing on those big labels, if you look back three, four, five, eight years ago, there would have been other labels they released on to get there. Yeah, you can follow the journey back. You can follow the artist that's just dropped that new banger on whoever. Follow that back, follow, go, go on their beat port and follow it back and you'll see a whole ton of labels that you might not have even known. Firstly, from a DJ point of view, that's great new music you might find and great, might great new labels you might find. Um, but I'll touch on it as well, like, you, you're now 20 years in, your career is, this is a career. It, it, it can take as long as it takes, it's a career. Careers take forever. And just take your time with it, you know? Yeah, definitely, 100%. I just want to touch on something really quickly at the end here, because I think the time we're in now as well, a lot of artists come up to us and have been asking us this question in more recent times about self-releasing, and because they see it, that's a path to get their music out there. What do you guys think are advantages and disadvantages to that? I'm for it. I'm, I'm, I think, like you're saying before, you want to, we want consistency with releases. I think. If you believe in a record and you're building an audience from a social point of view, then you can consist, have a consistency. Where you might get when you're a small artist, where you might get a track that's on tour room, or, uh, and then you might not get nothing for six, seven months, having a self-release just to have consistency and keep building it. Um, you also then learn the kind of process of pushing it yourself and creating all the content yourself and what goes behind everything itself. So you, you're keeping learning and you're keeping releasing music. Um, there's some great platforms to do self-releasing on from even SoundCloud you can now self-release on and the, and the, and the payout from SoundCloud is amazing from their fan base royalties. Um, so that it's, it definitely keeps consistency. It definitely keeps you kind of motivated as well because you, you're getting those tracks out you believe in. Um, it definitely doesn't have a gatekeepers like Matt that might stop tracks that aren't right going out. But then if you believe in them, other people might believe in it as well, which is in, it's, it, it works, you know? Yeah, I, th I think they're all valid points. I think the main, for me, the main point of contention is support, you know? I mean, we've got 20 years of sales history and hopefully respect and, and love at these kind of online stores, you know, Spotify, Deezer, Beatport, etc. If you're self-releasing, you've got no sales history, you've got minimal social media following, you've got 20,000 new releases every Friday popping up on Beatport. How do you cut through the noise? How are you going to get your record supported if, you've got, if you haven't got all those things in place? So that's... I get it as attaching something to your brand, like Noise Who's Done with the Techni thing, or, um, or like John Summit's done with Off The Grid, it's kind of a little adaptation to your brand, which kind of adds to the whole kind of story. Which they're is they're very big artists. Yeah, you know, but so they're bigger artists. But 
they're obviously going to get the support because they're, they're, as you say, they're bigger acts. But I think if you're starting out, it's just such a minefield in terms of trying to get your records to cut through. It's, it's, it's hard. I mean, it's hard for us. I mean, not every tour and record gets added to editorial. But you, you have the stuff. trust of, of uh, quite yeah, a that's, big that's lust of I, DJs as yeah, well. Yeah, that's what I mean. And that's coming from, from a, a well-established label with a, with a fan base and a following. But even with smaller artists, you've got, to, you've got to do a lot of work yourself. Like, even if you had a release yeah. on Tour Room tomorrow, for instance, you, you've got to put a lot of content out yourself. And that's what, that's what we teach from our YouTube channel. That's what we are trying to educate and make the content yourself, do the stuff yourself, you know, think about ideas to make content. And we, and we definitely, from my side, help people make content and come up with ideas to push their records, teach, you teach them how to grow their Spotify and grow their streams and their followers, you know. It's definitely possible and it definitely teaches you the methods that when you have a big release or a bigger label and you have got the support, then it just makes it even bigger, for, you know. There's, there, there's definitely an oversaturation of the market now due to the fact that people can self-release. And um, there's, there's like, as Matt said, there's hundreds of thousands of records put out into the market. So, right, how, how do you cut through the noise? You know, that's the, that's the hard thing. But at the same time, sometimes you believe in yourself so much that you've got no other choice. You know, you really want to get your music out there. So what do you, what do, you do? But like Graham says, you've then got to get into the sort of uh, the other side of it as well. So I suppose aware. you have to think as you would, as an individual, uh, do you have those skills? You yeah. know, do you have that confidence to do that? Exactly. That's the, that's the question you've got to ask yourself because it's not just about putting out music. You can't just build it and they will come. Definitely not. You have to, it's a it's a it's a business at the end of the day, and it's there's a whole there's a there's a production side and there's a marketing side, and I always think like we're going to spend all that time learning the music and learning to be an artist and finding samples and finding plugins, then you literally owe it yourself to market it properly yourself. So you have to learn that as well, and it's it's important. Good start. The time is actually flying by. Have we got any questions here for any of us? Why we're up for now? Yeah, go for it. I think he's going to bring a mic for you. I uh, actually have a question. Um, I feel that uh, nowadays um, artists put out a lot of records in short time. So um, I feel that a lot of times uh, the records, uh, they, they have splice vocals on it. They don't, um, they don't use a vocalist, for example. Uh, do you have any recommendations how to deal with that? Is it, should I do more quantity or, or should I more concentrate on the quality? Good question. All eyes on me for this one. <laughs> um, I think I don't think there's a problem with releasing a lot of music earlier on in your career. If you're looking, if you've got a little bit of a tick list and you want to kind of hit a certain li little list of labels, like we were just talking about target labels, I don't think that's a massive, massive issue. Obviously, in the digital world, digital music has got a, a shorter shelf life than it would have had back in the day and it, you see people releasing every sort of two to three weeks which I just I think, think it's, it's just too much it's just it's far too much I think it's too much it's that, it, it, you almost make your own music disposable because they know that oh three, two weeks time there'll be another one and I'll just replace take that one off the USB and I'll put the new one on there you're almost devaluing your own music by doing that I think you, you've got to remember that one big release that's all you need yeah can last six months in yeah. terms of the hype of how it lifts you and gets gig or gig offers and things yeah. maybe it's a shorter time than that now but i'm for quality over quantity 100%. also depends on the like is it an, an actual official release is it is it a free download the releases building numbers is it you know there's there's, a, there's so many different types of releases and um and as for the splice thing i john summit's deep end was a splice vocal make a correct make the best track possible uh, it doesn't matter if it's splice vocal just they can come off a of splice. With, with, with using splice as well, I'd say using splice vocals, the one thing that I say in the academy a lot, a lot is get creative. Don't just go to you know house vocals, volume one. Look for some hip hop, R&B, 90s acapellas, pitch them up, slow them down, chop them up, that sort of stuff. Don't just think you're just gonna grab one and just plonk it in a track and it's gonna be massive because then everyone can do that. And you gotta think everyone is writing house music. The first thing they're gonna search for are house vocals. It will be rinsed to death. So be a bit more creative with your digging and find something a bit more obscure and, and then get creative within that sample, chop it up, edit it and stuff. Personally, I think, I think six releases a year is enough. Every two months, maybe a couple of remixes within that um, and other things that might pop out. Never in December if you're small. <laughs> this, this Are you so talking height? Or? No, just if you're a smaller style artist, never do anything in December. Have a month off. 
Like, there's so much Christmas, end of year promotion, big tracks getting replayed. Your little, tr your, your your aspiring artist track, you're just going to get lost. Wait till January, have a month off, never in December. I think that's good advice. Yeah, really good advice. Anyone else have a question? So just on that, with the releasing music, obviously, how many weeks do you think is the best to prepare for the release in terms of promotion? So, I don't know, is it one month maybe? Or like, also like, so you, you Pete mentioned like maybe having released every two months, so maybe having like a marketing starting four weeks before and push, be pushing marketing four yeah, weeks Yeah, I understand what you're saying. I, I personally don't think that as one record ends, you need to be moving into the next one. I think it's too much. I think people will actually start. If you actually look at it and look at big artists when they really blow up, some, some of them have like a, a momentum and it's quite a lot, but actually it's not. It, it's all about a record and then it'll all be about touring and stuff like that. When I, what I'm talking about is like the hype, the social media sort of stuff. Look at other things. You don't want to just be going from record to record. You can do a lot pre now with you, like UGC content on, with, from TikTok and Reels. You can, you can start a little bit earlier with kind of attaching your music to something, which, is, which can help build hype. So what would you say if there was a release date? How early would you start? Depend, well, it depends on the label because there's a lot of shit labels and they will give you the release date the day before. And if you get the release day of the day before, then you, you, start, you start the day before. And there's definitely a way around that, but kind of keep an eye on your Spotify every week around when they said maybe it will start coming out. But uh, for, for, if you're a good label, yeah. then you know, start two or three weeks before, like start building a bit of content before and start thinking about it. Or just stop, plan what you're going to do around that content. Because have, I always think with a release, like what's the track called? And I think then what video can I find that I can attach that music? And I think... There's so many great, if you think about that, so many great artists, it's all about the visual as well as the, the music. And if you think about the, the biggest artists in the world, you know, the Madonnas and the, the, the really prime, massive, even like biceps, it's all about the visual and the audio. So think about how you're going to attach that audio to visual to make it for people to watch and listen to. And then take the track name and go, right, what 10 ideas can I get from that track name that maybe tie it loosely to, to music or tie it loosely to like someone said a track the other day it was like forget nothing and I was like well what, what things forget nothing well elephants forget nothing there's there's something maybe there's a bit, bit of string around your finger that forgets nothing right those kind of like just random ideas that you can then tie to a bit of music to pre before it even comes so out. get creative so a couple of weeks really before a couple of weeks before and just fin to finish off I, I want to say it's because this often comes up do social media numbers impact in our decisions Go on, Matt. It's like I said earlier, I'll always sign a good idea regardless of... I'll always hear the music before I do anything else, so the social media impact would come afterwards. I mean, if, you, if I hear a record and I'm like, wow, that's great, I want to know more about it, and the artist has got two million followers on Instagram and you know you're going to hit a, a decent, and I'm, then that's a bonus. But I'm not going to... I wouldn't look at the social media numbers first and then be like, right, I need a record from them. It's always the other way around. Again, it's the idea and the music is the most important thing. As I say, if you've got a, a built-in fan base that's already there, that you can plug into, fantastic, it's a bonus, but it's never a, never a first port of course. I guess as Torum, though, you have an audience that you can bring to an, a, a record, whereas other smaller labels, they will, they will definitely look at that because they'll look at it as a symbiont process of, right, the artist has got some numbers, we've got some numbers, we can A bit of a springboard, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas you, you as a, 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 a bigger label, have got a spring, your own springboard that you can add yeah. to. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good on his question. I think we'll have to wrap it up, though. Thanks for the questions, guys, and... Thank you very much for your insight. I hope you guys found that a bit more helpful, a bit of a deeper insight into kind of ways that you can push forward to get signed. Thank you. Cool. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Cheers, everybody.